here's the sower, Michael Guido of Meta, Georgia, with a seed for the garden of your heart. A little girl asked, Dad, can you write your name with your eyes closed? I think so, he said. Great, she replied. Shut your eyes and sign my report card. While you can hide your marks from man, you can't hide your mischief from God. He sees and knows everything. He keeps a perfect record of your life. Your past, present, and future are known to him. He'll not allow hidden evil go unpunished or hidden good go unrewarded. The Bible says God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. A seed from the sower has originated from the studios of the Guido Evangelistic Association, Meta, Georgia. Good times, weekdays at 5 o'clock. It's time now to visit the wonderful world of the great outdoors with the Southern Sportsman, Frank White. Today's show is brought to you in part by House Autry, proven cornmeal and flour products. By Happy Jack, manufacturer of the all-new 3X Flea Collar. By the Southern Sportsman Game and Seafood Restaurant, the best foods from the field and ocean. And by Long Haul Jeans, the most comfortable jeans you can wear. Today we will explore Sutton Lake, West Virginia, take a flying trip to Portsmouth Island, and cook Eastern Shore stewed fish in the kitchen. There are a lot of recipes for stewed fish, uh, but this is one of the simplest and the quickest and easiest that I know. You can do it right on top of the stove, uh, and it's just going to take a few minutes, as I will show you. Now, before you got here, I uh, fried six slices of bacon in the frying pan, and when they were done good and crisp, I took them out and I crumbled them up. Here they are over here, and I've still got uh, the grease from the bacon left. Now, I want to get on with this uh, cooking here as soon as I can because I've got a little way to go with it, not too far. But I've got a cup of cream, uh, about a half a cup actually, uh, over here, and dredge, dip, dip the fish in the cream, then dredge it in seasoned flour, which is just flour that's got uh, salt and pepper in it. Our sponsors, of course, good old Golden Eagle that we're cooking with here today. And turn the heat up just a little on my bacon grease. Now I've got uh, five or six small green onions that I have sliced up very thin and I've got some medium potatoes that are sliced into quarter of an inch slices quarter inch now uh, if you don't know what a quarter inch is get a ruler out before you start slicing because we're going to cook this particular stew in about 20 minutes that's a lot quicker than stews usually take to cook and the potatoes have got to be done in the 20 minutes so if you cut the potatoes too thick you will not get uh, them cooked at the end of the 20 minutes. And I think if everything goes right, I got my fingers crossed, but if everything goes right here, uh, toward the end of the show, I can show you the final step because there's a couple of steps right at the end. The bacon and a quarter of a cup of sherry figures into that. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to pop the heat to that right quick. That's got to cook until it's just lightly brown on each side, which takes about uh, two minutes on each side. In the meantime, I say one of the potatoes. I didn't slice it because I wanted to show you how it should be sliced. But slices about like I'm cutting here now. Now you see that? Uh, a quarter of an inch. And when they're that thin, they will cook in about 20 minutes. Okay. The fish is cooking over here. Incidentally, this is a rockfish stew recipe, but as a great many of you may know, there's a moratorium up on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland at least, not in Virginia, but uh, they're having problems with the rockfish up in Chesapeake Bay, and so this good old Eastern Shore recipe that I'm using that originally was for rockfish is adaptable to any other fish, catfish or anything else you might happen to have, and I happen to have some speckled trout fillets here, so I'm cooking it uh, a trout stew instead of a rockfish stew. But it's only going to take me about two minutes here to brown them on one side and get them flipped over. And we may as well use part of that time uh, right now for this pause for some very important messages.
Crime Stoppers need your help in attempting to solve the following armed robbery and assault and battery. On Wednesday, April 6, 1985, at about 10.20 in the afternoon, a 53-year-old woman drove into the parking lot behind Providence Hospital on her way to visit her husband. A man in a small red pickup truck followed her into the parking lot and blocked her in. He approached her car and demanded her pocketbook. She refused and he pulled a gun and struck her several times. He then dragged the woman from her car and drove away with her brown leather purse. The victim tried to run after him, but fell to the ground. The suspect is described as a black male, about 25 years old, possibly driving a small red pickup truck with stripes along the sides. If you have any information about this armed robbery and assault and battery, call Crime Stoppers at 799-9001. You can receive up to $1,000, and you do not have to give your name. Crime Stoppers serves Richland, Lexington, and surrounding counties. opened a museum for himself. Child, if I live to be a hundred, I will never see anything more ridiculous. <laughs> but then again, you should never say never. Okay, while you were gone, uh, I cooked it on one side and it browned nicely, just lightly browned is the way you want it. Now I've turned it over and it's going to brown on the other side and that's just going to take a minute or two. In fact, it's just about ready. So now I take my potatoes and put them all over the fish. Those thin slices, quarter inch slices, remember. Cover the fish up and on top of that I'm going to put my thinly sliced green onions. And this is a good hearty meal. Uh, we got to come back to it at the end of 20 minutes and finish it off. But I think I'll have time to do that. Here go the onions. Sprinkle them in on top of that. All righty. Now, water. Just up to barely cover the fish. Not over everything, but just enough in there. to just about come up to the level of the fish. And we put the lid on it and turn the heat down just a little bit and we'll just let it simmer and it'll just kind of steam in there and cook the potatoes uh, and the onions uh, and also finish cooking the fish. We've already browned it on both sides, if you recall. And then when we come back in 20 minutes, I'll show you what we do with the sherry uh, and with the crumbled bacon. Uh, in the meantime, I just got back from a, a nice trip up to West Virginia. There's some of the prettiest country up there uh, that I ever saw. I enjoy going up there very much, and particularly their lakes. Their lakes are all in the mountains up there, and on this most recent trip, I had the opportunity to go to a lake that I haven't visited before in my about three years uh, that I've been involved in going up to West Virginia. A good friend of mine, Denzel Courtney, who is a biologist with the Department of Natural Resources, uh, which is out of Charleston, West Virginia, but Denzel is actually uh, based in Fairmont, which is up in the north part, the north central part of West Virginia, he said, we've got a lake down here, hour, hour and a quarter south of us called Sutton Lake. And it is particularly good on spotted bass. It has a real nice population of the spotted bass. Now that's a Kentucky bass. It's a subspecies of the largemouth bass. And it ranges somewhere, its, its mouth is not as large in proportion to its body as a largemouth bass's mouth is, but it's uh, larger than a smallmouth. So, and I think somewhere back in there in, in time, in, in the misty past, there may have been a cross between the smallmouth and the largemouth that gave us this sort of a hybrid fish uh, that really fits in a niche somewhere in between there. It is a mountain lake, but it's not one of these really, uh, Sutton Lake is not one of these really cold, cold high altitude lakes. And it doesn't have the walleye population or the trout population that you might expect in one of these mountain lakes, but it does have the spotted bass, it has largemouth bass, and also has musculunge. And of course it has crappies, all those lakes have crappies in them. So this was my first trip to Sutton Lake. I was very impressed with the dam that they have there. And I've got a little film, a little preliminary film, to show you the dam itself. It's right above uh, the very picturesque little mountain town of Sutton, West Virginia. 
And this is a big cork in a bottle. It really is a quite formidable chunk of concrete they've put in there. And certain times of the year, and we thought we might hit them, however, they were pulling a lot of water through there, and it was a little bit muddy, and so we didn't hit walleyes, but it's good walleye fishing below there. Now, that guy's fishing right by a picnic table, and I stopped the guy, and I said, I'd have sworn I saw a picnic table down there in the water, and he was very upset. He says, yeah, the Corps of Engineers fixed this place up for us. They let us use it free. They don't charge us anything, and he says, and then these vandals come down here and throw picnic tables in the water and tear the place up and that sort of stuff. But anyway, there was a picnic table right out in the middle of the river there below the dam. Uh, in just a second here, you're going to see a shot from the top of the dam. Oh, uh, this is the lake above the dam. And I'll show you Sutton. Very pretty little town. Located, I'm um, just a half a mile or so. There it is. You're looking at Sutton now, uh, down in that little canyon, that gorge. And as you see here, I'm panning upstream. And that's how far above the town the dam is. But I say it's quite substantial dam. There's a lot of concrete in that thing. Well, the next morning, Denzel came down with his boat, and we were joined by some friends from Fairmont, Rick Heim, who uh, owns a, a recreational vehicle sales store. In other words, he, he sells these uh, motorhomes that you see running down the highway, uh, trailers that go on the back of pickup trucks, or other trailers with pop-up canvas tops on them, but camping equipment, recreational vehicle type equipment. And that's Rick's boat that you see there ahead of Denzel's. And also with us, Mac McCoy, who is from Fairmont and who is a fireman and a good friend of Denzel's and a good fisherman. He enjoys fishing very much. Now, this is one of these, not hydroelectric lakes, but one of these reservoir type lakes where they flood control water and feed it down the rivers for navigational purposes. This water will go down and they'll be able to float barges up in the Kanawha River and the Monongahela River and the Ohio River, these, these lakes in West Virginia. The majority of them, in fact, all of them that I've ever visited do that. Max got a nice little largemouth there. And this is a little spotted bass. You can tell a spotted bass from a largemouth bass because he's got a little round patch on his tongue uh, that uh, feels like real coarse sandpaper. It, it's got, you can open his mouth, hold it by the thumb like Denzel had it there, and look in his mouth, and there's a little round patch right on his tongue, right in the middle of it. And if you feel it with your fingertip, it feels like real coarse sandpaper. It's just a little patch of teeth that he has on his tongue, and that distinguishes him from the smallmouth and the largemouth. Neither one of those fish have that. There are other ways to tell, too. That was a crappie, by the way. We went up into the mouth of the Laurel Fork River and got into a shoal of crappies that apparently had run in there to spawn. And they were practically all small. We were throwing everything back anyway. Uh, they were keeping size, most of them. If you wanted to fool with them, keep them. I was early on the trip, didn't want to haul them around in the car. And these guys can go here and do this anytime they want to. So this is a photographic expedition, pure and simple. We're here to take the pictures and show you the lake. But you'll notice the lake is down about 30 or 35 feet. And it's because it's at what's known as Winter Pool. There's a little spotted bass. Uh, when they come out of darker water, they're more vividly colored than that particular one was. The bass have a tendency to take on the coloration of the water. And if it's light colored water, clear like this, uh, they'll be light colored. Just protective coloration. But the fish were swarming all over some particular little crappies. I decided I'd get my hand in there and catch at least one fish. But they draw these reservoirs down in the wintertime in anticipation of the spring rains. And that fills them back up all during the winter. They're using the water. They're feeding it downstream so that the barges and the other commercial tugboats and traffic will have plenty of water in the rivers to navigate in the Ohio River Basin. And then about April the 1st, they'll shut all the gates and they let these things fill back up. And on this same trip, I went to Summersville Lake. And in a couple of weeks, I'll be bringing you that film. But if you think this lake was down some, wait till you see Summersville, it was down 90 feet. It looked like uh, Lake Powell out in Utah, where there's no foliage growing around it or anything. It was so far up the banks. But Summersville is a beautiful lake.
one of the prettiest I ever saw with the water down or the water up because it's the Gauley River Canyon But we were doing pretty good there uh, on the fish. We caught all the fish we wanted to catch. I got a lot of film. That's Rick Heim sitting up there in the front that had the red cap. And uh, he, uh, as I say, he's from Fairmont along with Mike McCoy and the two of them were fishing in the boat. I was fishing with my friend Denzel. Uh, Sutton Lake is a beautiful lake. If you get a chance to go up there, you can anticipate that you, if you find out where the fish are and you should find somebody that's familiar with the lake to help you out, but you shouldn't have any trouble catching all the spotted bass that you'd like to catch, and also you'll catch crappies and some largemouth. And with any luck, we didn't have it, but with any luck, a big old musculunge that'll weigh about 25 or 30 pounds is liable to jump on your bait. I'll be back here in a minute. We're going to take a little flying trip down to Portsmouth Island and take a look at the surf and the Outer Banks, and that's all coming up after these very important messages. I realize a lot of you folks out there can't buy these fine House Archer Mills products because you've told me so. Your grocer just doesn't stock them. We're sure your store manager wants to serve your needs, so copy this address and give it to him. Tell him you want to buy these House Archery products. Some things like House Archery are worth asking for. House Archery Mills will be happy to serve you and your grocer with the finest products at a fair price. House Archery Mills products, worth asking for. Sneaky Snake, the live-action salt flavor worm, is the hottest bass-busting lure on the market. The folks at Seeker Lure make you this fantastic yet acquainted offer. We'll send you an assortment of 60 Sneaky Snakes and 140 tournament-tested worms and 100 Red Hot Crappy Jigs and 40 Frog Traders and 20 of the newest in lures, the Shining Shad, for the unbelievable low price of $23.95. That's a $60 value for $23.95. Call toll-free or send your check or money order to Sneaky Snake, Post Office Box 710, Mountain Home, North Carolina, 28758. What's so different about the Happy Jack 3X Flea Collar? It works. Manufacturers of animal health products for over 38 years, Happy Jack has achieved a dramatic breakthrough in canine preventive health care. The Happy Jack 3X Flea Collar contains a completely new active ingredient which kills fleas for 11 months, ticks for 7 months, and mange mites. Protect your dog and home year-round with the Happy Jack 3X Collar. Save an expensive trip to the animal clinic and a costly visit from the exterminator. Ask for Happy Jack. <laughs> your dog would. This is my partner here at the Southern Sportsman Restaurant, Bobby Carraway. What you eating? Uh, Maku shark steak. How about you? Fresh fried eel. Well, you could have had frog legs. Well, you could have had fish imperial. Well, you could have had quail with grits and gravy. And you could have had sweet and sour duck. And you could have had merry old soul. Rabbit supreme. Seafood platter. Stuffed rainbow trout. Ribeye. Fried oysters. Spicy boiled trout. Oyster pie. Fried the menu cactus. at the Southern Never Sportsman fried. is fried worth fried. arguing fried. about. Shark steak. You already said that. I've said this before about West Virginia, uh, but it's true. They have the best, of course, they have more horrendous pollution problems than most other states have. And in years past, uh, Sutton Lake and particularly Tiger Lake, lakes like that in the coal mining country were so polluted with acid uh, that they wouldn't support any life at all, hardly. The fish that were there were either stunted or they were trash fish like carp or catfish or something like that. But those people got together and they're doing a remarkable job on cleaning West Virginia up and better cooperation between sportsmen and the bureaucracy and the Corps of Engineers in any place I've ever seen. That applies to the Pittsburgh Corps of Engineer District as well as the Huntington, West Virginia District, and those are the two that I'm most familiar with up there. But uh, those people really, the Corps of Engineers is really conscious about the wildlife. They're building a new dam up there called Stonewall Jackson, and it's gonna be a hunt, hunter's paradise. They've got 20,000 acre refuge up there that's just loaded with bear and, and uh, deer and turkey. And in about three or four years when it's finished, and during this most recent trip I was up there, I'm doing an in-progress study on Stonewall Jackson, and I'll be showing you a little of that uh, as we go along. It's not quite ready yet, but I'll be going back up to West Virginia in about a month and a half with some more stories, and in the meantime, you're going to see the Summersville Lake story in a couple of weeks. Now, uh, about this time of year, I start listening out for phone to call, and I go around to the tackle shop, and I listen, and I start reading the paper, and I got some rumors. I in fact, I talked to Katie Morris down at Atlantic, North Carolina, and she said they caught a few puppy drum last weekend and a few sea mullet, what I call whiting, but they call Virginia mullet or sea mullet along the outer banks, and she said they caught a few of them, 
and it looks like things are about to break open. Well, the weather was beautiful, gorgeous, except we were warm, then we had a couple of frosts, and then it warmed up again, but I couldn't wait. I said, well, I've got the machine, the vehicle, to go and check the outer banks and find out if the fish are biting. So let's go down now at 7 o'clock in the morning to Greenville, North Carolina with my good friend Billy Bird. And he and I, uh, I think we'll have here in a minute some film somewhere, but he and I went out one morning at 7 o'clock. We don't have the film. Ah, oh, we do have the film. Okay. And we rolled out the little zebra to take her off. This is my little magic carpet, my flying machine, or whatever you want to call it. Now, you can't land on the beach of the Outer Banks anymore. And what you have to do now is go down to designated strips. There happens to be one designated airstrip on my favorite island down of the Outer Banks. It's called Portsmouth Island. And near what was the old Coast Guard station, it still is, it's preserved now historically. The Coast Guard is not there anymore. They've been withdrawn. But there's a strip there, a grass strip, about 1,600 feet. Here I'm fastening the surf rods onto the struts. They're too long and bulky to put into the cabin of the airplane. And Billy and I took off. Now the man had forecast that it would be nice and lovely in the morning, but the wind might get up in the afternoon. But that didn't bother me too much. This is the Pamlico River that you see here on the right, and the next shot you see on the left is the Pungo River that runs into the Pamlico. That's Bell Haven you're looking at right off the tip of the rods there, if you're familiar with that part of the country at all. Fly right down the northern edge of the Pamlico River in order to stay out of the military operations area there at Cherry Point. And when you get to Great Island, come right to 145 degrees, and in a few minutes you'll see Ocracoke and then Portsmouth Island. This is Portsmouth Island. And there's the landing strip. You see right there in the middle. It looks kind of small from up here, but it gets bigger when you get down there close. Well, I wanted to find out if anything was going on that particular morning. This was a weekday morning. It was Wednesday, and the fish that I had heard about had been caught over the weekend. So I thought I'd see if somebody was on the beach. We dropped down to 500 feet altitude and flew down to, all the way to Drum Inlet. There wasn't anybody in Drum Inlet. There wasn't anybody along the beach fishing, but I didn't care because the advantage of this little machine is if you get there and the fish are not biting, you get back in the airplane and fly home, and you're home in 45 minutes. This is a four-hour drive and then a two-hour boat ride to get over there any other way that you can get there. If you can get from Greenville to here, in less than six hours, uh, you're pulling some magic stunts, a little carry landing here, a little trifle bounce. But the little old girl held together real fine. And uh, that's the strip at the Coast Guard Station at Portsmouth. Now, in anticipation of this walk from here, it's about a mile out to the beach across sand. And uh, that's kind of hard walking in places, particularly the first quarter mile or so, because it's just a track through the bushes and very sandy and hard to walk in. So I brought a pack frame and I've got my little knapsack there with, uh, I had a quart of water and a quart of iced tea and uh, three or four cans of potted meat, a stack of crackers and the bait. And all that was in that little insulated pack bag plus the fishing tackle and the rods and reels and all that's got to be toted out to the beach. And you notice those black things in, sticking out of the top of the pack, they're the most valuable things of all. That is the rod holders. And when you get out here, if you stand out here two or three hours and have to hold your fishing rod for the whole time, pretty soon you get tired of it. So that was the greatest luxury we had were the three rod holders that we carried out. This is the flat, it's hard to believe, but once upon a time when our ancestors first descended on this island, all this flat place you see here was a lush, high forest of pine and live oak and palm trees. I'll take that back, not palm trees, but pines and live oak, huge pines. And the original settlers at Portsmouth cut it all down, and then they turned cattle in to graze on the traffic. And by the time they got through with it, there was nothing left. Well, this is what greeted us. We got out there. 
And we hadn't been there 30 minutes, and the man was right. We got a 30-knot wind. It finally got to where we couldn't even keep a lead in the water. So we sat, and we waited, and we watched, and we waited. And I wouldn't say exactly nothing happened. We caught one small flounder, which we threw back. But that was it. And finally, the wind got so tough that we couldn't stay there anymore. So we went back and got in the airplane, and we flew home. And if we had uh, not, uh, I, I, see, what I was doing was just trying to get my feet wet. I was just testing the water, just trying to find out. It was pushing the season a little bit, and I knew, particularly since we'd had that cold weather. Uh, so we didn't catch anything, but in a few days, they'll be there. I'll be back here in a minute with a final word after this. I feel comfortable outdoors, especially when I'm wearing my long-haul jeans. Not only are long-haul jeans practical, they're the most comfortable jeans I've ever worn. Long-haul jeans are cut bigger in the seat and the thighs, and they're made from stretch denim, so they look good and feel good, even when I stretch, bend, or sit. And that's important, because it looks like I'm going to be sitting here quite a while. Long-haul jeans, the most comfortable jeans you'll ever wear. I would like to invite you to an open house at Sharing God's Love on Sunday afternoon, June 2nd, from 2 until 5 p.m. Sharing God's Love is a cooperative community outreach center seeking to serve persons in physical, emotional, or spiritual need. It is located at 7068 Nursery Road, behind the First Baptist Church of Irmo. The center houses a food bank, clothes closet, telephone referral center, and other goods and services. Sharing God's Love is staffed entirely by volunteers, ordinary people just like you and me, who are willing to give of themselves for others. Come out and see what we're all about. We need you to get involved, too. Remember, Sunday, June 2nd, from 2 till 5 p.m. at 7068 Nursery Road in Irmo. Thank you. Try not to leave the refrigerator door open too long to save energy. How much energy do you think you saved on that movie? I didn't save nothing. I got the cheddar cheese. Our recipe is about ready for the final stage, which is to put in a quarter of a cup of the sherry and to sprinkle the crumbled bacon over all of it. The potatoes are done, they're nice and tender, and the whole thing is ready to take to the table right now and serve. I wish you were gonna be here, because we're gonna eat it up in just a minute or two. Uh, the folks at Montgomery Technical College have asked me to tell you that they have a gunsmithing course, a gun engraving course, uh, and a taxidermy course, and uh, registration for the summer quarter is May the 30th. If you're interested in gunsmithing, or metal engraving, or in taxidermy, get a hold of these folks at Montgomery Technical College at Troy, North Carolina, and they'll take care of you. I think that's about all the time we got. We'll see you here next week. Please do not litter, and do yourself a favor. Take a kid fishing. Today's show has been brought to you in part by House Autry Cornmeal and Flour Products. By Happy Jack, manufacturer of the all-new 3X Flea Collar. By the Southern Sportsman Game and Seafood Restaurant. The best foods from the field and ocean. And by Long Haul G.